So the topic of tonight's debate is will European land use destroy Australia's unique biodiversity? But perhaps we should go one further and ask whether Aboriginal land use has destroyed Australia's unique biodiversity. The fact is the arrival of any aggressive new species is dramatically going to change the ecosystem that they're arriving into. The question is how much out of balance we've bumped the ecosystems. Has it really changed that much? Will it change more? Is it all bad? Perhaps some of it can actually be a good thing. Can a compromise be struck between human land use and protecting our unique biodiversity, or should we give up now? And most importantly, can we prepare for a sustainable future? Tonight, we'll be hearing from some of Australia's top scientists and land managers as they debate these questions, building on their work at the Australian Centre for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, which is ACIUS. Uh, it concludes their grand workshop, which I like that title, Alison. Grand workshop, it makes it sound far more exciting than any other kind of workshop. Um, where they've been crunching data and knowledge on animal and plant extinctions and how best we can manage our land. To debate the topic tonight, we have the affirmative team that will assert that European land use has indeed had adverse effects on Australia's biodiversity. Team captain is Chris Johnson. Wave your arm. <laughs> Uh, he's an ecologist and conservation biologist with wide interests in, in basic and applied ecology, environmental history, the biology of extinction, and he's specialising in the study of mammals. Having studied ecology and conservation of mammals throughout Australia, from the northern tropics to Tasmania, Chris recently moved to the University of Tasmania from JCU in Townsville, where he's still an adjunct professor. Also on the team is Jasmine Lynch. She's currently an assistant professor with the University of Canberra. She lectures on environmental management and her research has taken her everywhere, I like to see in her bio. She's been from semi-arid, tropical, subtropical, temperate, Mediterranean, subalpine and wetland ecosystems. She's done field work in the sub-Antarctic, New Zealand, Indonesia, Crete, Israel and Jordan. She's been everywhere, man. <laughs> David Keith is also on their team. He's, he's from the government. He's a research scientist in biodiversity group from, of New South Wales Department of Environment and Climate Change. His recent book, Ocean Shore to Desert Dunes, has rapidly become a standard reference and important tool for e ecological education. And on the negative team, we have team captain, which is David Bowman. We have two Davids this evening, which might be slightly confusing. One of them is on this team and one of them's on that team, just to help you out. David Bowman is one of Australia's most productive and accomplished ecologists with over three decades of research experience across Australia. He joined the University of Tasmania in 2007 where he is a professor of environmental change biology in the School of Plant Science. Barry Brook, is this one just here? His work at the University of Adelaide focuses on global climate change and the impact of that climate change and global warming are having on traditional risks to natural systems. In recent years, he's become a respected commentator on energy policy and has con conducted considerable research on systems modelling for sustainable energy. And he also runs a blog called Brave New Climate, which has got a, a lot of attention. And he has authored a book called Why Versus Why Nuclear Power uh, with Ian Lowe, who apparently is also in the audience somewhere. And Professor Wayne Meyer is the last person from the negative team. And we can call him Farmer Wayne because he's the only <laughs> agricultural science, scientist amongst us. He's an irrigation, crop and resource management <coughs> scientist. In recent times, he's worked with researchers from a range of organisations on sustainable farming systems, the application of precision agricultural techniques and modelling natural resource management systems. So that's the team that we have for everyone. Tonight's format is very simple. The evening will be split into two halves before intermission, which is when you'll be able to go and get more drinks. Um, we will have each of the speakers will do their five minute spiel each. And after the four minutes, I'll dingle gently. After five minutes, I'll ring really loudly. And after six minutes, you can start throwing things. Um, our debaters will then take their seats and we'll have drink time, go to the bar, go to the toilet, ring your loved ones, all that sort of stuff. Then we'll actually come back and we will um, have a summing up from the captains of the, each of the teams. They'll do an extra five minutes to convince you 
that their team is definitely right and the other team is definitely wrong. And based on all of this, oh sorry, after that, we'll then have questions and you guys can get to confirm or, you know, ponder the ways that these two, have been, two teams have convinced you by actually asking questions and we will presumably take questions from Twitter as well. The hashtag, I believe, is either RIOz or you can do hashtag biodiversity. All right, I think that's it for the, for the introductory stuff. We're ready for our first speaker, which is from the, the affirmative team. We have Jasmine, she's ready to go, she's rearing, she's coming up to the stage even as we speak. Please make her very welcome. <laughs> right, now Jasmine, uh, your time starts now. Quickly go. Better start. <laughs> Australia's biodiversity is unique and it's mega diverse. We are one of the 17 countries that together occupy less than 10% of the world's surface, but support more than 70% of the biological diversity. Here, we have over 800,000 species and many of these occur nowhere else. Many of these also only occur here. Of the flowering plants, 91%. Of the frogs, 93%, the marsupials, 90%, and most of the 3,600 species of fish occur nowhere else. So we have a responsibility to look after this national treasure. We've committed to do so too, internationally and through national policy and legislation. Through ratification of the Convention on Biological Diversity in 1992, development of the National Strategy for Ecological Sustainable Development, also in 1992, the National Biodiversity Conservation Strategy, and under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999, our primary legal framework for protecting nationally and internationally important flora, fauna, and ecological communities. All states and territories have similar policies, legislation, and, and stated commitments. However, despite this responsibility and despite these commitments, there's a recognised ongoing decline of biodiversity in Australia. And this, to me, is indicative of four factors. We haven't adequately implemented these commitments. We've attempted to balance rather than maintain ecological values. We rely on a command and control approach, even though it's failed spectacularly in the past. And our understanding of how to manage our ecosystems for long-term sustainability is still poor. Because of these four factors, our land, our land management practices have, and they will continue, to devastate Australia's unique biodiversity. The decline in this biodiversity is well recognised, has been for two decades, and it's ongoing. The 2011 National State of the Environment report acknowledged that many species continue to decline. And this is happening in conjunction with broad scale land degradation. Two and a half million hectares of land affected by dryland salinity. 90 million hectares by soil acidification. Broad scale water and wind induced erosion. And over a quarter of our nationally significant wetlands are affected by altered water regimes. There are over 2,800 threatened ecosystems and 1,260 threatened species of plants. In 2006, the Australian State of the Environment Committee stated that it is only a question of how long it will be before pressures overwhelm the resilience of the remaining ecosystems. A major problem with trying to implement and protect to implement our commitments and protect these communities and their functioning is that the National Strategy for Ecological Sustainable Development aims to integrate and balance environmental values with economic, social and equity considerations. In reality, they're often in opposition and the environment is disproportionately traded off when it comes to development. A precautionary approach, a stewardship ethic, these things reinforce the importance of maintaining rather than balancing ecological values. While the Convention on Biological Diversity recognise that we need to use ecosystem species and genes for human benefit and wellbeing, this should be done sustainably in a way that prevents the long-term decline of biodiversity. Most people live in urban situations on the coastal fringe. 
Their encounters with nature are now with those species that are adapted to those environments. They see an abundance of eastern grey kangaroos, brush-tailed possums and the occasional but unfortunate snake and generally think there's too many of them and in the case of snakes that even one is one too many. If they encounter wombats, rock wallabies or cassowaries, it's generally care of David Attenborough or as roadkill. As long ago as 1996, Holling and Meff re referred to the pathology of the command and control approach to managing natural resources. They stated that we dampen extremes of ecosystem behaviour or change species composition to attain a predictable flow of goods and services or to reduce destructive or undesirable behaviour of those systems. In effect, we manipulate, construct and alter ecosystems but then seem surprised at unforeseen, undesirable results such as loss of ecosystem function. We are not to blame for all of this. However, we are at fault for not having a holistic approach, for not treating our landscapes and ecosystems as complex systems with multitudes of independencies that maintain their resilience, for not applying a precautionary and adaptive management approach that implements changes cautiously, experimentally and with monitoring and evaluation of the program's actions and outcomes. Unless our attitudes change and unless we work together and learn from our past and present how to sustainably conserve and manage our ecosystems, the ecological reality is a future of ongoing devastation of our unique biodiversity. We have David Bowman, who is from the negative team. It's very negative, isn't it? Yeah, um, thanks a lot. Thanks for, uh, <laughs> are we ready to rock and roll? Yep, hang on. All right, and your time starts now. Speak quickly. Yeah, so what I want to actually uh, challenge you with is that the, the, we're actually got a land management debate here, but actually we've also got a land management crisis. And I think that's actually framed by two issues. And one issue is, Really, the resources aren't there. The human resources, you know, it's a bit like having a global pandemic and, and sending in some people with first aid, you know, people like me, you know. No, you know, it's so limited. It's, you know, I've worked in management agencies and our human capacities are extremely limited. That tells us something about the values of our society. And it's also the kit that we've got as conservation biologists. It's, pretty, it's a pretty minimalist kit. And you actually have to think about that and say, well, well, why is this so? And I'd actually say that the reason of the, this underlying crisis is actually ideological. Because what we're doing is we're actually, we're in the Stockholm Syndrome. We've got our own little personal prison and it works perfectly. And the, the talk we just heard is an absolute classic example. You construct a prison and then you say, look, we're trapped. And you refer to self-evident truths and you convince yourself that in fact that the debate we're having is not about now, it's about the past. And what the, 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 the conceit of this debate, the trope of the debate, which is pivotal, is that in fact it's all about environmental sin. That we're all actually sinners, our past is very bad, the future can only be bad because we are sinners. Now the problem with the Stockholm Syndrome is there's no redemption in this narrative. It's a narrative of sin, and badness, and badness leads to the only thing is to look back in the rear view mirror of when it was good and there wasn't sin on this earth. So we're driving around looking in the rear view mirror whilst there's a biological catastrophe occurring. And that my argument is that in fact, European management, we're not talking about past European management, we're talking about the now, that is actually the key to solving the problems. But because we're trapped in our own personal prison, we don't even want to face up to that we ha actually have opportunities to do things. Because if we do things, we have to be pragmatic and that the two sides of this debate really are about the romantics and about the pragmatists. And, and I'll make a personal confession. I want to be a romantic. I want to see a diprotodont. I want to see a thylacine frolicking in a C3 eucalypt woodland. I want to see those things so badly. I want to be able to commune with nature. I commune with nature as much as I can. You know, but the fact is, I've got a problem. 
My problem is I've been given a scientific ed education. And that sort of cuts through the romanticism and says, let's actually focus on the now. Let's actually stop trying to live in 1788, making an unobtainable baseline so we can always regress back into, we are sinners, we can never actually do anything because it's always bad. So we, we've, we've developed this, this crazy thing that the solutions to the problems we have means that we actually have to do stuff, really real stuff, real interventions. We actually have to take risks. We actually have to la manage land. The key to the solutions to our environmental problems is actually European management. That's actually the key. That, so this bizarre debate, in a sense, is, it actually is beautifully framed. The negative view is actually the positive view. It makes perfect sense when you think about it that way, but of course the romantics will remind you, but that is a sinful view. You're a bad person for thinking that because 1788 is where we should be, but we can't be there. Now, I want to give you a concrete example of how trapped we are, we are in our thinking. Consider Kakadu National Park. Kakadu National Park, a premier World Heritage National Park, is the birth child of a uranium mine. That's why it exists because of a uranium mine. In the 70s, Kakadu was a radical solution to a very challenging problem that Australia had as it entered into the exportation of uranium. Kakadu was part of it, but Kakadu was a radical solution because it was also a joint managed national park. Do you want to know something really weird? 30, 40 years later, Kakadu is still a radical proposition. Why the hell in the 21st century, are we not challenging ourselves about the way we're managing land with new and improved sorts of kakadus? Let's imagine if we actually stepped up to the responsibility of the exportation of uranium and actually took the waste back and took responsibility of what we're doing and used the rental of that to actually subsidise some real interventions where we could actually improve biodiversity outcomes, but that takes risks, that takes guts, and that actually takes a decision not to be looking in the past, but looking into the future. He's singing songs of redemption. Amen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> For the positive team, to try and um, move us out of the church, perhaps, <laughs> back into the lab, we have Chris Johnson from the University of Tasmania. Thank you. And I'm going to affirm oh. something negative. You ready? Yes. Now? Yes. Set? Yes. Go! Okay, moralistically, St Augustine said something like, Lord, make me virtuous, but not yet. Uh, I think he meant it was chaste, actually. Um, so I'm going to wallow in sin for a few minutes, but then I'm going to say something hopeful at the end that might actually agree with David. So will European land use devastate Australia's unique biodiversity? Of course, it, it already has. It's, it's already been devastated, but it's too early to give up hope. The real questions are how much further is it going to go and what can we say from the wreckage? Now, I'm going to illustrate this by talking about mammals because I love and care about and know a bit about Australian mammals and they've been devastated. Um, Australian mammals make our biodiversity unique and they're in terrible shape. We've lost 24 species since Europeans arrived and about half of the survivors are now rare. Um, over large areas of Australia, most of the original mammal fauna is just gone. It is devastated, not, not there anymore. A great South Australian, Headley Finlayson, travelled from Adelaide up to Uluru several times during the 1930s, and he described dozens of mammal species, rodents and rat kangaroos and bandicoots and things, that when he went back in the 1950s were completely gone. So there's a problem there. We've lost them, but the problem is deeper. We've lost a lot of ecological function. A lot of those mammals were important for soil, ma maintaining soil health and, and dispersing seeds and dispersing fungi. Um, some beautiful work by Dr Alex James up at the Roxby Downs site showed that you actually need bilbies to dig little holes in the ground in order to trap seeds and organic matter um, in order for plants to regenerate. And if the bilbies aren't there, then it all blows away and you get erosion and loss of productivity. So that's what's probably underlying this loss of mammal species. <clears throat> How much further is it going to go? Well, the, the problem hasn't stopped. We're still losing mammals. One of the issues that we've been um, grappling with in, in this working 
group at ACES is the fact that it's, it's still happening in northern Australia. In Kakadu National Park, about four species have gone extinct within the last 20 years, and the abundance of small mammals is down by about 80%. And we, we are sort of staring down the barrel of another six or seven mammal extinctions within the, in the next couple of decades. So what's gone wrong? It's mostly unintended consequences of European land management. Um, the cause of all this is, is not exactly cows or sheep or forest cutting, at least not directly. It's the invasive species that came in with them, especially foxes and cats. And we've reconstructed landscapes in a way that has um, allowed those predators to, to run rampant. So we helpfully provided rabbits for them as a, as a, a food subsidy to maintain their populations. And then we took out dingoes, which are a, a pretty effective biological control for foxes and cats. So they were given open, uh, open slather uh, uh, to, to consume Australia's mammals. <clears throat> so if we want to start rebuilding biodiversity and save some of the wreckage, we have to think again, and then we have to get optimistic and pragmatic for the future. And so, a pragmatic proposal to restore mammal biodiversity is to rethink management of dingoes, relax control on dingoes, let them come back and operate at their ecological potential and control foxes and cats, and then do reintroductions to re-establish species in those environments. Um, that's not an especially popular idea in country Australia, and we need to think very carefully how to manage the conflicts that, that, that come out of that. And again, it can be done using European um, uh, ecological tools. I'm doing a, a really interesting project at the moment on livestock guardian dogs, which are these fantastic European dogs that actually uh, live among livestock in flocks of sheep or goats or cattle. Um, they, they grow up with, with livestock and bond to them and all their social development is in relation to, to, to the animals that they eventually protect. And then they do become true guardians and protectors of livestock. And in the course of that, they separate dingoes from the sheep that the dingoes would otherwise be eating, and you get a reconciliation. So the ecological function of the dingoes is still there. The sheep farmers are happy. The sheep may safely graze. And in a system like that, we could start to rebuild. Thank you. the amount of religious uh, connotations that we've had thus far in a science debate. <laughs> this is unusual. For the negative team, we have Farmer Wayne. Thank you, Farmer Wayne. Take it away. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to disabuse the team of that the, roma the ro romantic notion that we've been introduced to. And when we look at the topic, it invites this pessimism and introspection. So, as my team leader has already said, let's think more generally and positively. Not that which we have or have not done, but that which we can do. We need to confront the romanticism that nature is fixed, pure and self-replicating. It's not. This ideology is certainly not valid. Ecology, the relationship among and between living things, including us, it's fickle. It's an evolving and competitive system. We, it changes and adapts to the stresses and the opportunities that are provided within the environment. Now, the Australian landscape and its life forms has evolved and will continue to evolve. It's changing. Grazing and agriculture change by order, no question. The distribution and abundance of flora and fauna has changed. It's part of evolution. It's the part of the business of what we've got in terms of what's driving our species and how we, how we manage on our landscape. Those species that can't adapt are replaced by those that can. Let's move from the past to the present and possible positive future. Let's confront the ideology that land use needs to be an industrial monoculture. Our existence is dependent on this managed thin veneer of soil, vegetation and lower atmosphere for both production and for our ecosystem services. And we need to move beyond this notion of the tyranny of the theodolite, where we have imposed on this landscape lines and rectangles, a landscape that evolved in geological terms 
in anything but straight lines and rectangles. And indeed, we have opportunity. We are farming, we have farmed on the average. The opportunity that we now are provided with is that we can be, look at sub paddock level variability. We all know, every farmer knows, that there is variability out there. Some areas are more productive than, than, than others. We can start to think about and use that variability to advantage. To be more productive and to take those less productive areas out and to start to create a very different looking landscape that has both of these features in it the production and the conservation. We need to get away from this romanticism of purity and stability of nature. European style land use will not devastate our bio biodiversity because we are going to adapt and change rapidly. Why? The drivers are already present. The real cost of energy is increasing. We're on a one-way ratchet system. That will flow on to costs associated with what we do with, uh, with our agricultural production. There is a price on carbon. We have changing lifestyle choices. There are other values uh, uh, on, on land now other than its productive value. We are valuing it for other, other purposes. We have a changing set of attitudes, the whole notion of, of stewardship. And there's more people. The demand for food and fibre, seven billion people and counting, will continue. We'll have, uh, we will have new and better land use, multi-purpose land use. And it's going to be more mosaic in style. This is, the, this is the promise that we've got. Large open monocultural areas will be transformed with farming to land capability at a level and a capability that we've not seen before. We will increasingly value agroecosystems for their support of native systems and it will become part of our, of our agricultural system. Rice paddies for wetland species, pine cones for, for, for parrots, pastures for kangaroos, all of these are possible. European style land use will not devastate biodiversity. Affect it, yes. Change it, yes. As will any form of land use. As will any form of land use. Evolution is continuing. All species, including us, are changing and evolving. Our landscape and management is evolving, so some will survive, some will not. So European style land use will not devastate our biodiversity because we will evolve more responsive, multi-purpose land use systems. We will have systems that are more mosaic in concept, areas identified as productive and responsive, increased connectivity and managed for multi multiple purposes, including biodiversity. Thank you. means that given that he had an extra seven seconds to go that maybe I should just give another second seven seconds to these guys <laughs> from the positive team we have David Keith the man from the government <laughs> Not any more, actually. are you ready on your marks go declines and losses of biodiversity are pervasive in Australia from the ocean shores to the desert dunes our proposition is simple the magnitude, pervasiveness and the ongoing nature of these declines ring loud and clear. And this is the evidence that Australia's biodiversity is on the road to devastation. It has been devastated, it continues to be devastated, therefore it will be devastated in the future. The Black Knight may cry, it's only a flesh wound. But the bleeding stumps where his arms and his legs used to be are there for all of us to see. <laughs> Chris told us a compelling story of mammal decline. There are many others. The coastal floodplains of the southeast of the continent were amongst the first to be cleared and developed for agriculture, and they were later drained. Today, less than 5% of the original vegetation remains, and much of that is highly degraded. We've lost biodiversity, we've lost the ability to use those landscapes to produce agricultural goods, and we've lost landscape function. The legacies are acid sulphate soils, unsuitable land, and offshore sedimentation. 150 years later, the iconic Coolabar woodlands of the inland floodplains were undergoing clearing rates of 1.5% per year, the same order of magnitude as the loss of tropical forests in Africa and South America. Our coral reefs have undergone a 50% decline in 
coral cover in the last 40 years. And this, on top of the weakened capacity to recover from an increasing frequency of bleaching events and ocean acidification. This is a global biodiversity hotspot and a billion dollar a year uh, economic resource for this country. 80% of our river red gum forests are in a state of severe dieback at the present time. They're responding to a coincident 50 to 70% decline in river flows, and in particular, a reduction in the frequency of small and medium floods. A related phenomenon is that we've <clears throat> undergone a 75% decline in water, water bird populations throughout the Murray-Darling Basin, despite the last two years of exceptionally high rainfall. Without those, it would have been a 90% decline. As well, there are cross-continental declines in endemic plant uh, plant species, endemic flora that make the spectacular Stirling Ranges and Fitzgerald National Park and, uh, and the Tasmanian heathlands. This is due to a root rot disease that was introduced and spread by humans. Population declines of 97% have, have been observed in a 15-year study. So the causes of biodiversity loss are diverse. Land clearing, overgrazing, soil degradation, overexploitation of water resources, invasion of feral animals and plants, epidemics of introduced diseases, pollution of coastal waters, changed fire regimes, and all of these are compounded by climate change. All of these things have a common thread, human activity. So what do we do? Can we turn back the clock? Can we bring back the megafauna? I don't think so. Perhaps we can distract from our problems by creating some even bigger ones. Um, let's, let's have some elephants instead of cane toads. <laughs> In fact, that was a spectacular idea, wasn't it? What a great initiative, introducing cane toads. We can't go on with this displacement behaviour. We cannot blunder from one spectacular land management mistake to another. I suggest three things. We need credible science to design robust actions. What do I mean by robustness? I mean, we have to spread risks across multiple plausible options. And we, we need to seek out low risk in the face of uncertainty. There is, after all, much that we do not understand about the way our ecosystems respond. And that diversity of responses includes a place for our reserve system. The last thing we want to do is manage our reserves the same way as the, we manage the rest of the landscape. We need that diversity. Second idea, learn by doing. Let's manage adaptively. Let's do structured experiments that are integral, an integral part of land management and sea management. And thirdly, let's confront some root causes as well as the symptoms of these problems. Um, do we curtail production and human activity? No, of course we don't. But we do need, need to manage human population growth and resource consumption. That is the real elephant in the room. And we need a socio-economic system that avoids legacy costs, things that we, we do now and pay for later, the asbestos, if you like, of biodiversity. If we fail, then the only thing we learn from history is that we never learn anything from history. And finally, to sum up his team, Nuclear Barry. <laughs> I think the affirmative team have done a good job at describing the scale of the problem that we now face. And indeed, back in the early 1980s, when the discipline of conservation biology was being founded on the basis of ecology and traditional wildlife management, uh, one of the founders argued very persuasively that we were in a crisis discipline akin to cancer biology, where we had incomplete information, we had limited resources, and we had really big problems to deal with, and that's certainly the case in terms of biodiversity conservation today. And Earth system scientists are now talking about a new era, a new geological era that's been created by us called the Anthropocene, the age of humans, when we become a dominant force driving not only the world's ecosystems but also other physical systems that really determine how the planet as a whole functions. Well, that, of course, invites an interesting question. If we're in the age of the humans now, the geological era, 
and all other geological eras beforehand have ended, and most of them have ended with extinctions, then when does the Anthropocene end? It probably ends with either humans going extinct or leaving the planet. Now, the leaving the planet sounds very science fiction-y, uh, but what I really mean by that is human society pulling back effectively from its impacts on the environment rather than uh, trying to change the basic uh, way we interact with the environment. But to, to pull back whilst at the same time maintaining what we are as a modern society requires a very different way of thinking. And actually, something that's often perceived as having the most severe impacts on the environment, and that is the urban systems that we've developed, and now more than 50% of all the human populations live in cities, is probably actually a guideline for how the future should develop. And so the guiding principle, I would argue, is uh, that we should intensify rather than sprawl. So what we've tended to do is do both um, and do neither one particularly uh, effectively. So we have got large cities, but the large cities are themselves heavily dependent on our exploitation of the larger landscape. Um, and what we really need to do is continue to concentrate where humans live and where they interact with the environment in such a way that we're still not having that wider impact. And to do that, obviously we need some quite out of the box type solutions, but we also need to think about which of the three major aspects of human impacts on the environment we can most influence. Now, David Keith raised one of those. He said population. We need to think about population growth. The problem with population is not that it's fundamentally an important thing to control, not that it's fundamentally hasn't been a major driver of extinctions and biodiversity losses, habitat losses in the past. It's that it takes a long while and is very difficult to change. Uh, really, the only humane way to change human population size is to control birth rates. And to control birth rates, the only effective way we've been able to do that uh, is to increase our wealth and our technology and the education of women to do that. But even with all of that, it's still a century, multiple century scale prospect. Indeed, I did some calculations recently which showed that if somehow the world could implement a one-child policy from 2030 onwards, the whole planet, we would still have six billion people on the planet in 2100. That's the momentum we have in uh, human demography. So technology, techno fixes, intervening, I think is going to be really important if we're going to be able to effectively reduce our footprint on the larger landscape while still maintaining a society where population gets under control and where our resource use gets under control. Now, to do that requires a lot of energy and a lot of high technology, which environmentalists have traditionally shied away from. To get a lot of intensive energy to do artificial farms, like there's been proposals for vertical farms and franken meat, where we grow meat in a laboratory, uh, other biotechnological interventions which environmentalists don't tend to like, like genetic engineering to greatly improve productivity, desalination to provide the water for this, really uh, concentrated forms of energy like nuclear power to be able to provide low footprint, really intensive power, high power density that's required for this intensification. Now, that won't make the whole land management thing easy. It'll just make it easier now, this is a form of European land management that's a technological and futuristic type view rather than one that's looking back in the past, where human society is still trying to flourish, but it's trying to do so where we have the resources, the energy, and the lack of footprint to have a, a devastating impact on our landscapes. Thank you. All right. Were we convinced? I want to see wombats walking around, giant wombats. I'm not sure about the elephants. <laughs> um, now we get to vote on who you think is winning so far, and then you get to go to the bar. So I scroll across. There we go. There we go. Who do we think is winning so far? Too close to call. The positive team, the negative team. I want to hear the summaries first. <laughs> so you get to start voting now. Go right ahead. You've got eight seconds left. No, very convincing from this side with the, I want to believe, it was very X-Files. This side, impeccable logic, 
passion. You can tell the passion on this side of the room. It's going to be tough. All right, we've all voted. The results are? Oh. <laughs> so far, negatives, but you also want to hear the summaries. Who is your favourite speaker so far? Oh. Oh. Um, I'm guessing you might want to press number seven. You can start voting now. <laughs> if you don't press number seven, well, I don't really have anything to hold against you, but anyway, you just, you really want to press number seven. I'm quite sure of it. <laughs> All right, and the answers are, oh wait, here we go. You actually get to start voting. I thought I'd press that already. You probably don't want to vote on who's the best at driving this clicky thing. <laughs> All right, and the answers are, oh, <laughs> only 11%. <laughs> Meanwhile, I want to see a diprotodon. on. Maybe I should have just said that a bit more. All right, thank you everyone. Please proceed to the bar while our team sum up. Uh, we're ready to get on with the second part of this evening. And so we will hear the summings up from each of the team captains for the positive team. We are ready with Chris Johnson. No, we're not having Chris Johnson. Had a sudden change of captain team, team captain. This could be very confusing. <laughs> Hello, my name's Chris Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> but your name was David Keith before. <laughs> We have David Keith for the positive team. Take it away, David. Thanks. I changed my name. I, I'm such a romantic. Um, actually, what is amorous about loss of biodiversity and devastation? I, I don't get it. It doesn't really turn me on. Um, but actually, what does seem romantic is this, this notion of the vision splendid, you know, these wonderful fields of, uh, of Australian pastures that are miraculously adapted to, uh, to accommodate our biodiversity so that we don't, we don't lose any more of it. Um, this is the Australia Felix of Sir Thomas Mitchell. Um, not romantic. Um, or perhaps, uh, perhaps we should go into space travel, um, leave the planet. Um, some kind of vision splendid there, romanticism? No, no, that's a practical solution. <laughs> and uh, I've got my ticket booked. Um, the, the other thing that we've heard is, is that history, the history of biodiversity in Australia, is, is being trivialised as sin. Um, now, I, I don't mind a bit of sin, but, um, but you know, there's one, one thing worse than, than sort of feeling guilty about sin, and that's denying it. <laughs> Our problems are not just past actions. Okay. There are new dimensions to these environmental problems that are emerging uh, every, every week, every month, every year. Um, they're not something of the past that we should feel guilty about. They're an ongoing thing. Um, as our, our colleagues have said, um, Australian ecosystems, ecosystems anywhere, are dynamic beasts. They change continually. And as a consequence of that, we're confronted continually with new problems on how to avoid loss and extinction. Uh, an extinct species cannot adapt. Um, and the, the other thing we've heard about is the time, the, the time scale of solutions. Like, you know, let's not worry too much about population problems and the associated issues. It's, it's squarely in the too hard basket um, because we can't solve it overnight. It's going to take centuries to slow the population down. Well, actually, if we'd have started doing something when we first realised that human population size and resource consumption might be a bit of an issue, uh, we'd be well on the road to, to resolving that particular pressure. Um, we cannot displace our responsibility to address the root causes of these problems and simply only deal with um, the symptoms. And is intensification an issue? Um, intensifying human land use, centred populations, um, new ways of obtaining even energy even more intention, intensively. Well, some of our problems have actually emerged because of intensification. Um, we need to, to, to not just treat symptoms. We certainly need to treat symptoms. Uh, we cannot ignore those, but we need to deal with the causes as well. Thank you. And to sum up from the... Um 
Were you the positive or the negative team? I can't remember. You were so positive despite your negativity. That's right. It's very postmodern. Which actually, yeah. which actually leads me to my point, actually, and that is the world has changed. I mean, actually, even the way we're engaging now is so technological. We're, we're so technological. And a friend of mine said to me, who works in a land management agency, like a dyed in the wool greenie, you know, she said, this is my generation, said, you know, when I was at school and we got told by the school teachers all these bad things were going to happen at the end of the century, but they never told us about iPhones. You know, and, and that's, that's the point, that we do like our technology and we have to be realistic if we want to conserve biodiversity that we have to understand that the, the, the constituency might be us and, and a purity of talking to conservation biologists, but actually in the real world, we've got to actually be communicating with the public and politicians. And, and I want to reflect on some of those issues because those issues of constituency building really hinge on what is actually going to happen. There are going to be technological fixes. We do them all the time anyway, I mean, you know, that's what humans do. They use technology to fix problems. Our technology has become incredibly powerful now. Do you think we're going to scale back? Of course not. We're going to actually keep using our technology. But meanwhile, back in the conservation biology world, Tasmanian devils, an incredible thing. We've already lost the thylacine. Terrible thing is happening to a Tasmanian devil. Now, there's a very simple technological fix for that problem. That's to pick up a Tasmanian devil, population of them, as genetically as diverse as possible, and put them on an island. It's a very simple technological intervention. Do you know how long it's taken for that to happen? And by the way, it still hasn't happened. There's been an enormous talk about it because there could be unintended consequences because the Tasmanian devil's a predator and it might eat something on the island. <laughs> I mean... Really? You know, really? That's, that's where, you know, that's sophisticated conservation biology. We've actually, you know, meanwhile in the real world, we're standing back as a mineral boom is happening and we're asking mining companies, could you put back that hill the way it was before? And they'd say, fine. And there is a group of people in the mining industry called the Enviros, which are a bit wacky and they mix with the real people who are doing the digging up and the Enviros go out and they collect seeds and they try to make it look like what it was before because that's what the mining companies are trying to serve the society and the message they've got. Why the hell aren't we telling the mining companies make a novel ecosystem as biodiverse and as resilient as possible and really interesting? Why aren't we asking that? Because they'd probably say, fine, we've got a lot of machines. How do you want it to look? We say, oh, well, we'd like, you know, the, you know, the 21st century capability brown. Let's make some landscapes. <laughs> Let's actually and populate it with stuff and put a big fence around it and employ people to patrol the fence. Hey, and then we get to the elephant joke. Really funny joke. <laughs> Pit yeah, really funny joke. Pity about the fact that the rise of China is meaning that the survival of the last remaining megafaunal lin lineages on Earth is far from certain. And here we have, oh, a pastoral lease and cattle is, is, is OK. Somehow the conservation biologists, that's OK. But if you said, let's make a fallback position of an African game park in Australia, that is sin. That is, in fact, so sinful, you can mock anybody who says that. You can tell them they're a dill. You can put a dunce's hat on them, probably technologically, little holograms sitting over my head, <laughs> because I'm such a dick. Because, because I actually was able to say, why, if there are all these problems, why don't we actually think about some innovative solutions? No, because conservation biology says you're not allowed to think outside the square unless it's an incre incremental step and it's quality checked to be made certain that it doesn't actually achieve very much. <laughs> we have a multicultural biota in this country. In fact, all of the stuff we've brought by definition, ethically, has rights. But apparently, it's perfectly OK to ask the government to blow away camels. Blow them away for no other reason than that they're camels. We're not even thinking about 
the opportunities those camels and possibly other megafauna might have in enriching our biodiversity. That is an ideological straitjacket. That is actually really dumb, and I would suggest possibly future generations will say is a form of environmental sin. That what we have to understand is that if we don't use European management to, to achieve outcomes, what is this team actually talking about? What is their management? Their management is just a whole lot of motherhood statements. It's not about anything. What I think we need to be able to, to, to give society a narrative that actually leads somewhere, we have an opportunity to manage this wide brown land with love and skill and reason. We shall wrap up this evening's proceedings. Now we have one more um, uh, clicky thing, so get out your clicky doodads, because we have the question of who actually won this debate. So I will scroll across, and here we go. Who won the debate this evening? The positive team, the negative team, or still couldn't decide? Now, press that, your voting starts now. Time's up? No, not yet. Now time's up. All right, and we get to find out who actually won. Oh, excited? Drum roll. There we go. The negative team won. Although it was quite close. <laughs> I don't think the negative team win anything. I think they just get the, you know, the love and accolades from the rest of the room. Maybe a pat on the back, maybe a beer. Maybe a beer. Yeah. Because um, you, you're free to stay and have a drink. The bar's open for another half an hour. Have a chat with these wonderful people here. And um, thank you very much for coming along to the debate this evening. Mm.